The story you're about to enjoy is a factual tale, read to you from a fictional location. We believe. Madam, I'm sorry to inform you that we've lost another mailman. Hmm. Well, darling, you return his undelivered mail to the post office, and I'll call the, um, gardener. He's not dead, madam. He's quit his route because he's terrified of the library wolves. Romulus and Remus? They're good boys who only want to play and eat. And if those mailmen would only carry a little raw meat with them like any civilized chimpanzee, they wouldn't have to worry so much about their trousers and throats. They are good boys, madam. I think of them as my own children, you know. Hmm, I am aware, Mr. Darling. Welcome back to the Midnight Library, my dear guests. I'm your librarian and host, Miranda Merrick. Those of you present at our previous reading no doubt recall our dark tale of pussycats from past times. And so this night, in an effort to be even-handed, we're sharing with you the enticing tale of dog-headed men. Nearly everyone here on the grounds of the Midnight Library can categorically be described as a dog lover, albeit for various reasons and to varying degrees. But suffice it to say, I'm overjoyed to tell you this story. It's one of mystery, beauty, and long-ago lore regarding one of our most beloved animal companions, combined with the beast we know best, ourselves. So... Let's get in touch with our inner beasts, shall we? Admittedly, the pronouncement of the existence of dog-headed people is a difficult proclamation in which to place one's belief, no matter how charming it sounds. So let me give you a brief list of those who have purported that they themselves personally cast their eyes upon these wondrous canine creatures. Three that may carry some credence were world-famous explorers, Marco Polo, Christopher Columbus, and Alexander the Great. The fourth was a saint, who was rumored to have been a dog-headed man himself. And it is not Saint Bernard, as many among you may have hoped, but Saint Christopher. Well, I'm more optimistic already. We'll return to their individual stories after we gain an understanding of the time period and exotic lands that were supposedly home to these enigmatic beings. Several lands and cultures have some variation of dogmen embedded in their narratives. You know with almost certainty that ancient Egypt is one, but also Libya, Ethiopia, Greece, Central Asia, India, and the Americas all have their stories and reports of dog-human hybrids. One such story even cites the lands north of the Dale Nor or North Ocean, and the famed and mysterious Lake Baikal. And although we may encounter, if we're lucky, a current charming rumor of some similar cryptid in modern times. The recounting of these entities primarily dates back as far as several hundred years before the Common Era, and as prominently as the 15th century. Before written language noted the half-dog men, the oldest known reference to them is their image deeply carved into a cliff face in Libya. Believed to date back 4,000 years, the carving clearly shows two people with heads like dogs that have killed a rhinoceros. Another depicts a mighty dog man wielding a club while a diminutive dog child follows him along. Mysterious, terrifying, and fantastical, dog-headed beings can be found in spectacular fashion in an array of art forms, from crude rock carvings to extravagant paintings. They are listed among all manner of creatures in ancient bestiaries, as well as featured as characters in literature. 
They are lushly depicted in gilded manuscripts, engraved upon ancient monuments, as well as soberly documented in Old World maps and in travel journals of daring and respected explorers. They range in description from raging half-beasts to dignified, graceful beings. Remind you of anyone? Tonight's reading at the Midnight Library is proudly brought to you by Groomingdales. Ladies, if you finally married the dog man of your dreams, Groomingdales has everything your breed of canine erectus could possibly need, from discreet flea collars to custom-fitted trousers with accommodating tail holes. You'll be able to step out on the town in doggy style. Visit Groomingdales on Bark Avenue. Many of you are undoubtedly familiar with the beautiful depictions of many animal-headed deities within the Egyptian culture, Anubis being the jackal-headed god of the dead, engraved on countless tombs and walls, and noted in hieroglyphic form on various surfaces. But we will begin exploring here, on the human plane of existence, looking for the first written records of the dog-headed men. One of the first fairly detailed accounts was about a race of cave-dwelling dogmen, written by the Greek physician and historian Tizias in 400 BC. His statements are simple and simply fascinating. During his travels to Persia and India, he documented the assorted peoples and cultures he encountered. In one such writing, he refers to a particular group of beings he met as the Sinocephali, whom he claims lived in the mountains of India, which at the time was known as Indica. Sinocephali, from the Greek language, easily breaks into sino, meaning dog, and cephali, meaning head. Tizias writes that he witnessed a tribe of people that had human bodies, but the head and facial features of dogs, complete with elongated snouts and fanged teeth, and that their entire head was covered with fur, exactly like that of a common dog. He states that while the beings understood human language, they had no human speech, but instead communicated by making the sounds of yips, barks, and growls. And though they had human-like hands, They had long, narrow, curved nails that grew from their fingertips, and that they were seen to gesture with their clawed hands in a kind of signing language, as the deaf and mute are seen to do. With the exception of reportedly being exceptionally long-lived, Tizia states this race lived from 170 years to past 200 years, The society of dog people was said to be comparable to many human societies of the time. They had their poor, their wealthy, their coarse, and their sophisticated people, but each of them had one thing in common. They all had the heads of dogs. They stood upright, some cloaked in skins of other animals, not rough-cut skins with fur, but finely tanned hides neatly fitted to their forms the more wealthy among them dressed in quality linen robes. They did maintain a somewhat feral type of existence in that they did not build or live in homes, but instead were said to dwell in tribes in caves that were abundant in the mountainous land. Tizias notes that inside of the caves they had no beds, but slept upon mounds of grasses and leaves that the women among them bathed once a month, and the men did not bathe at all, but only washed their hands. However, both sexes were said to anoint themselves three times each month with a kind of oil they made from milk, which they wiped all over their skin with an animal hide. You know, as one does. In his notes, Tizias portrays the dog people as adept hunters that could run down their prey and skillfully use bows and spears, and that they civilly roasted their food on a spit over a fire before eating it. 
They appeared to be diversified in their abilities and social rankings, as some were hunters, some were farmers, and the most successful of them herded many head of sheep. They in turn traded the fruits of their labors with the human-headed peoples in surrounding villages. It's casually stated that they mostly traded their cultivated fruits, animal hides, and sheep and goats to obtain flour, cotton, and bread, as well as weapons such as swords and bows and arrows. It's extremely interesting to me, as a dog lover, that Tezeus credits his canine citizens with having one more feature rarely mentioned by other witnesses. Tails. He writes that the dog-headed people, the cynocephaly that he met, sported tails that were equally upon males and females, situated above the hips, just like dogs. Only the cynocephaly's tails were greater in length and had long fur. Not a terrible look on some, I imagine. Now, dear guests... Let us return to the aforementioned personalities writing to us from an existence in our world's history, recounting their witness of these enigmatic creatures. Alexander the Great, upon invading India in 326 BC, wrote in a letter to his mentor, Aristotle, that he and his men personally engaged the dog-headed men in battle. He noted what fierce fighting skills they possessed, but also that some were captured and they behaved wildly and were vicious, barking, snarling beasts. It is believed that Alexander's inclusion of a manuscript within this letter was the first telling of the epic story of Beowulf. Be of wolf, perhaps? In the 13th century, Marco Polo, in his travels to the island of Aingamanen, in the coastal region of Burma, described the cynocephaly as people with heads like mastiff dogs. He wrote of their brutal habit of hunting, killing, and eating anyone who was not of their race. Even the now contentious Christopher Columbus, when arriving in Haiti in the 15th century, reported upright walking dog faced men that captured and ate their enemies. One of the most compelling amongst so many of these tales is that of St. Christopher, who is clearly depicted in Eastern Orthodox church artwork with the head of a dog, in lavish paintings as well as in graven images. And although it is possible that this portrayal of the saint may have been due to the mistranslation of the land of Canaanias and the derivative word canine, he is prominently portrayed in this astonishing form. Walter Speyer, a German bishop and poet of the time, wrote describing St. Christopher as a huge, dog-headed man who came from the Canaanias where he lived a savage life. Then, upon meeting Jesus, he renounced his former abominations, and being baptized into his new faith, his canine facial features then disappeared, and he took on a human likeness. St. Christopher, then actualizing his faith, became a hero and a martyr. Often depicted bearing the Christ child upon his shoulder, he is the patron saint of travelers. This is the gentle nature in which we still see him shown today. A minor loss, if you ask me. Perhaps even a major one. The Midnight Library invites you to be secretly blessed by the only dog-headed saint in existence. Visit St. Bernard by the little doghouse behind the village church rectory during any full moon. Just bring a treat and whisper, Here, boy, St. Bernard will come running with a mouthful of holy slobber to anoint you with his canine blessing. You will be endowed with keener senses and rabies immunity for two weeks. Gentle pats on the head are permitted. Visit His Holiness, St. Bernard. My dear guests, 
I think it's worth stating that since the extensive list of explorers, historians, missionaries, artwork, and books describing and depicting dog-headed men is in fact so prolific and far-reaching and from so many cultures and time periods, it's downright difficult not to entertain the thought of at least some credibility being embedded amongst the stockpiles of documentation. We live in hope, do we not? We at the Midnight Library have amassed for you a wonderful array of the artwork mentioned in tonight's reading. It's positively drool-worthy. You'll see. Now, if you'll keep to Mr. Darling's heel, he'll try to lead you safely to the exit. Good night, my lovelies. Good news, madam. The post office has replaced the timid man with a sharp-looking woman. She has jet black hair and the palest skin and a, a little ring piercing just here. I don't see why you should need to describe the woman letter carrier, darling. We're all the same on the inside. I believe the library wolves have proven that. My point is, madam, I believe her to be one of us. Oh, thank heavens for that. In that case, cancel the groomer's orders to make the wolves look like Dalmatians, please, Mr. Darling. With pleasure, madam. The Midnight Library is co-produced by Tess Feifel and Astonishing Legends Productions and is edited by Sarah Voorhees Wendell with music and sound design by Ryan McCullough. Special thanks to Miranda Merrick and Mr. Darling. No part of the show may be reproduced in any manner without express written consent. Copyright Astonishing Legends. All rights reserved.